First up, we have an interactive planetarium database with Ken Brandt, Sarah Schultz, and Keith Turner. Good morning. Mm, that's terrible. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> I'm Ken Brandt. I direct the Robinson Planetarium in Lumberton, as you can read on the slide. And this is Sarah Schultz. She directs the Minnesota State University Moorhead Planetarium in Moorhead, Minnesota. Keith and Tim could not be here this morning. Uh, why we're presenting this paper, we are all doctoral students pursuing degrees, uh, advanced degrees in science education from the University of Wyoming. And we're, our focus and our research is going to be a planetarium as a teaching tool. And to improve that, or, uh, we will be using and gleaning from you all good teaching practices. Uh, so we're getting away from the model of the sage on the stage. This is the team. Uh, left to right is Keith Turner, Ken Brandt, Sarah Schultz, and Tim Slater. And Sarah's taking over. All right, so um, I want to first thank all of you for actually making it to the first paper session. Um, congratulations. Um, so <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, so basically, the idea is that we're looking at interactive. And what does interactive really mean? And so you have to kind of define that. So according to the internet, which is the official on everything, um, that's what you get. I'm not going to read it, because you can read it for yourselves. Um, so the thing is, is that we actually need to define interactive for ourselves as a planetarium community. So according to Carrie Berglund, and many of you know her, um, she has very uh, interested in interactivity, and um, this is what she had to say. So kind of having some direction and impact uh, based on the interaction that you have with your audience. But the question is, how do you really know if you're interactive? What does that actually mean? What does it look like when you go into a planetarium program and it's kind of like a fly on the wall aspect? What would you see that may, you would immediately know that this is an interactive planetarium program? So we have presented this in a couple different areas. Um, and this is some of the stuff that we've heard from you. And if we had a little more time, we would be asking you right now, because we like to interact with our audiences, um, what you think interactive means. So here's our list. And really, it's kind of based on the communication and the discussion, talking back and forth, an exchange of ideas, and not really just, like Ken mentioned, the sage on the stage, projecting and basically vomiting every information that you know onto the people and hoping that some of it gets into their brains. So we want to know what people are doing to be interactive. Um, and we want to know how you do interactive. The best way for us to learn from each other is to actually experience other people's planetarium programming. And as we all know, just like at this conference, we're all learning from each other. And you know, that's really the best way for us to be able to improve ourselves and our own presentations. But of course, we don't have the time or the resources to be able to do that on a regular basis. Um, and so the idea is to basically just get a survey of what people are doing in their planetariums and be able to share that with the planetarium community. Because then we have this resource and people don't have to leave their domes in order to find out what's going on in other domes and improve what they're doing in theirs. Um, and the basic idea for our PhD thesis is to reproduce um, a survey, a paper that was done in 1967 by Curtin and that paper basically just took 33 um, planetarium recordings, presentations that were recorded, and went through and did a survey and kind of an inventory of what everybody was doing. How many times did they talk about Polaris? What else did you talk about? And so what we want to do is do a similar thing, but look with an eye on interactivity. So what are people doing in their domes to be interactive with their audiences? This is where you come in. 
and the rest of the planetarium community. We need you to record yourselves and send it to us. We'll do the dirty work. We'll go through and do that survey and we'll catalog everything that you're doing in your domes, but we need you to make the first step. We need you to get those recordings and send them to us so that we can do this and provide this as a service to hopefully the planetarium community at large. So here's where we need more help, and this is where we're actually gonna be interactive today. Hopefully, you have some questions, comments, suggestions. There are bound to be hurdles that you, in your dome, will experience in recording or trying to record your shows. So we wanna know how we can help you be able to get past that so that you can provide your, um, your recordings to us so that we can do this. Um, so, Gary, if you wouldn't mind, if anybody has any questions, comments, suggestions, or issues that they foresee with being able to record um, their presentations, please let us know. So does anybody have any ideas, comments, questions, anything like that? I think that uh, in, in communicating with your audience, the first thing is when they, when they are actually entering the planetarium, uh, and uh, for me, it's like having a choice of music that sets the mood uh, that something important is about to happen and something exciting is about to happen. Okay. And, and when, when you can create that mindset before they even sit down, uh, you, you've already established the first part of communication. Excellent, okay, wonderful. So that's one way that you can know this is going to be an interactive presentation. Any other questions, comments, concerns? What we're looking for really is to get your digital recordings. Use a cell phone or just a little handheld recorder. If we can get audio and video, that's great. If it's just audio, we'll manage. Um, I know there's a lot of people, I mean, it's dark in there, so what are you going to see anyway, right? Um, but maybe you have a special camera that can actually pick that up. But really, we're looking for just the, the presenter. We're not looking as much at the audience, but we really want to see what the presenter is doing to engage their audience. Any other? I work at a university, and whenever we're doing research, we have this big human subject protocol, yes. even if we're just talking to someone in the hallway almost. We've uh, done it. Do you have similar barriers, and does that apply to the recordings that come to you, or is that something you just yes, we've sweep gone, under the rug? Uh, Tim Slater actually submitted the IRB proposal to the University of Wyoming's um, Institutional Review Board, and they've approved us to do this project going forward. So, so if you, we're if good. You, Sorry, if you have um, issues or if you have, if your university or institution has questions about that, we can provide that. Um, and it actually is um, good, uh, it applies for the United States as well as Canada. So we can do both. So we can provide that to you if, if you need that for justification to um, your administration. We have it. Anything else? It's really hard to do interactive at nine o'clock in the morning on the last day of the conference. Yeah, especially <laughs> after the last hospitality suite. I was just going to say that. <laughs> yes. But our there contact, are people. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, sorry, sir. Our contact information is on this slide. If you, want, if you have more detailed questions or you want to figure out, well, I've made my audio. How do I submit it? Please email one of us or more of us you know, and um, you know, pass that along. We'll, we'll do everything we can to help you, help us, help everybody else. Okay? We promise. <laughs> um, usually a cell phone really works well. Um, and, and yeah, like those little audio recorders are pretty cheap. Um, if you're at a university, I know I've, I'm talking to my IT um, support and to see if they can help me figure out how to make a good recording. But overall, a cell phone does pretty well. I've done a few myself. Any other comments or questions? Concerns, anything that you see as an issue? I missed the uh, first six minutes, so I don't know if this has already been said. <laughs> but 
Um, I just found that um, recording myself and watching myself was actually very valuable. And so I highly recommend it just from that standpoint. Um, and uh, then if you can stand to see it yourself, then you know that it's going to be great for everybody else. <laughs> but don't let that stop you either, right? So you don't have to listen through all of it if you don't want to. You can still submit it to us, and we will do, like I said, we will do the dirty work. Can I just uh, get a quick show of hands? How many of you think you're actually going to be able to submit something to us? You know, just a quick show of yay, nay, or it's possible, I guess, is the way to rephrase that question. Okay, you then how many of you think that you would like to, but you really don't think it's going to work? You think you'll have, have issues? <laughs> okay, come and talk to us, and we'll see if we can figure it out. Did you have a question? Question. Um, one of the things that I discovered were, when recording myself was I thought there was a lot of extra talking in the class. For students were not on task, <laughs> whatever. And then when I listened to the tape, I heard them talking to each other about what I was talking about. <laughs> Very nice. That's a nice benefit. Okay. All right, well, anybody else? Last call. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming this morning. We know it's tough, it was tough for us too, um, but we really appreciate it and really hope that we can get a lot of recordings so that we can do this. We're hoping that it's gonna be a service to the planetarium community. So thank you all for coming this morning. Thank you. Our next paper will begin in three minutes, so you have a couple of minutes to use the facilities and refill your coffee cups and whatever. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. The last one in the session. I'll talk with him in the back. He's our tech person.
All right, our next speaker is Dale Smith, and he will be telling us about creating a 100-show roster. Good morning. Is everyone still awake? And I'll pretend to be awake. After 30 years as a classical dome, we put in full dome, spit side dome um, three years ago. And after 30 years, we built up a large roster of programs. And being old, I didn't want to lose them. And so part of my talk is going to be how we preserved our roster of existing programs while adding a lot of full dome programs. We had a number of live interactive shows. I wanted to keep those. We had about 75 classic shows that is slide-based shows, and I wanted to add in a number of full dome um, shows. So converting the live interactive shows was easy. They'd been based on our optomechanical Minolda star field before, and I just rearranged them to work off the Starry Night um, star field. So that was an easy um, conversion. We had about a dozen live interactive programs and four workshop style programs, and all of those are now adjusted um, to work off Starry Night and in a way that I think is actually more, uh, is faster and more time efficient than when we were going off the optomechanical projector. And next was our classic shows, a lot of them began build up over 30 years of operation. We had 64 shows we purchased. This sounds like a lot, but it's roughly two per year. Um, and then we'd made about 20 shows um, in-house. I didn't want to lose any of those, especially the ones we'd made ourselves. So before we were funded, um, those of you who know me know that I'm crazy in some ways, uh, before we were funded for Full Dome, I scanned in and digitized all 24,000 slides from all of those shows. You'll be, be being prepared. And you know the scanning was straightforward. Uh, the, the trick was getting them organized into folders so they would be easy to import um, into shows when, we were, when I was encoding them in SciDome. I've described all those details in previous papers and in the proceedings, so I'll skip them here. Um, in 2014, once I knew we were funded, then I went through and did the image adjustment, brightness adjustment, cropping, sharpening, those things on those slides. And then once SciDome was in, I learned how to do the encoding of shows in the at and system. I described that in previous talks. I've also written um, a detailed user's guide, which I've published in earlier versions of the proceedings we'll have as, a, have as an appendix um, in this year's proceedings. And so setting up timelines, um, I encode over a couple of years of labor of love and basically living in the planetarium. Um, encoded all 84 shows um, that we'd had. So, so all of those are now available to me. It's just find file, press play. Um, and that was partly for my ease and partly so that whoever eventually comes after me might actually use some of those shows without having to go through any um, setup gyrations. We have a few more shows to do. I bought um, Glippa's shows that we didn't have and we'll be working on those over the next year um, or two. And so there's lots of shows. This just runs through a, a list of them. Um, there's a quiz at the end on the names. <laughs> um, and then the other goal uh, was to build up a whole roster of full dome shows. When we bought the system, um, three shows came with it. And I bought two more at the time of purchase. One was done in the Space Age. Um, and the other was Secret of the Cardboard Rocket. Both of those have been very popular um, shows and good choices. Together, they cost about 15000 I would have liked to have spent more, but I wanted to make sure we didn't run out of renovation money. So once, all I, had, once I had all of the classic shows encoded, uh, then I turned my attention to building up a roster of full dome shows. And they're expensive, so I needed a budget. Um, so we had um, roughly $27,000 of operating budget carryover um, at hand. That, that sounds like a lot. But that had taken 20 years to build that up. 
and the university was challenging all carryover, so I was under some pressure to spend that down. I didn't spend it to zero, but I spent about 27,000 of it. Then we had an agreement uh, with the renovation fund, which was half a million dollars, and we came in under budget with that, that whatever was left over uh, would be used uh, to buy full dome shows. That budget got closed out, and I wasn't told about it. Um, and at a certain point, I contacted the provost, say, can you have your, your budget person check up on the status of this? And we, after due course, we found out there was 15K left over. So I went to the dean and provost, hands out, you know, that's my money, and, and they promptly refunded that to me. So that gave us another almost $16,000. Then um, I had had, my chair had withheld uh, recently an entire year's budget from me and slashed my operating budget by 40% because I was over budgeted. And so I was short by about $20,000 from what I would have had otherwise in that carryover fund. So I said, well, what budget do I control <laughs> that can't be challenged? And so after about a week's thought, um, I wrote a check for $20,000. It's the biggest check I've ever written. And then since we, were in the, we are in the era of matching funds, I got my nerve up and asked the dean, um, I should back up and say we were, the renovation was funded 50-50 by the, uh, the Arts and Science Dean's office and the provost's office. So I got my nerve up um, on a Wednesday afternoon, emailed them and said, I'm writing this check. At that point I was committed to writing the 20K. And can you guys together match me? By 8.45 the next morning, both had said yes. Uh, I, I, I was in awe of that. And so you put all those pieces together, we had about 83,000. I'll never see that amount of, I think I understand how much money that is, but it's more than I'll ever see um, again. But that gave me the, uh, the flexibility um, to buy a lot of shows um, and have a range of topics in the public shows and serve a range of ages in the school group shows. And this is a list, um, I've, I've excised out uh, what we paid because that's confidential information. But this is the list of the shows that we, we got. Um, ones included installation, um, some free shows that I can get my hands on, ones that we first bought through the carryover funds, and then in the column on the right side, um, the shows we bought after putting together uh, the remaining renovation money and my money and, and the deans and provosts. Money we ordered from a number of different vendors, they're listed here, and so we now have a total of around, I think, 32 or 33 full dome shows. So there's, so there's a wide variety for teachers um, to, uh, to choose from and a wide variety for us to schedule in public shows. So you add up all those numbers, 17 um, live shows, 84 classic shows, 32 full dome shows, it's a little more than 100 shows altogether. And that means that um, even polar bears, uh, if you can read Danish, you'll know this, um, says you two can relax at the Hotel White Falcon, um, which is in Greenland, but it shows that even polar bears can come and enjoy um, my hundred shows. And that's my eight minutes. Um, yes. Questions other than are you crazy? You actually have four, two to finish your ten and two for questions. Okay. Uh, let's see, I saw Dave's hand first. How hard was it to take your slides and put them on the full dome screen as far as positioning and, and so on? We yeah, the question is. Uh, how hard was it to put your it's existing slide, JPEGs were they by then? Yeah, put it, put it. Uh, where you want it on the dome. Okay, I'll put it on the, that was easy. Um, say so find a set of virtual slide projectors on the dome and I can specify location and size. Um, and then uh, would have one folder per physical slide projector from the classic shows and just brought uh, the slides up from there. So that was actually pretty easy to do. Um, and of course, there's um, your flexibility in, uh, in using the digital programming compared to the physical slide projector, so we, uh, which reminds me of a point that the classic shows, once we had them imported, um, were actually enhanced. They were better um, than the slide version. Images were brighter. I could make them a little bigger, more flexibility. And I think 
they were sharper. The images were better yeah, color saturation. Just the image. Yeah. So my intent had been preservation, but there was also a lot of enhancement, and that was a really okay. nice side benefit. Okay. I was going to make two a comment and then a request. Um, first off, the comment I really appreciate. I applaud your use of free programming when you can find it, because it's a, a challenge for a lot of us is to get that low cost or no cost yeah. content. And the second one, can you flip it back one slide? So I can sure. That. Thank you. And this, uh, the information in this slide will be in my text in the proceedings. So you can extract it from there as well. I'm sure you've probably addressed this in previous talks, but the uh, huge number of slides that you scanned Mm -hmm. I was curious what the process was because when I've tried to scan slides that have silver tape on them and opaque, I get really terrible results. Yeah, um, what sort of slide? Does that mean I have no time or? No, no, if you want to. Okay, okay, great. Um, I bought a slide scanner from B&H in New York um, after doing a lot of homework and reading product reviews. Um, and that, that it turned, once I learned my steps in the learning curve, that was an easy process to do. I had, um, a rotary slide, not a codec tray, but one that would seat in that projector so I could do 100 slides, or set up 100 slides, go away and come back um, a few hours later. Um, for the image adjustment, there was almost no crop, occasionally some cropping, usually some brightness adjustment, and usually not, I could remove blemishes, but I didn't need to do that often, nor very often do color adjustment. The only images that really had trouble with um, were black and white images. They basically couldn't do those. Um, and the way I saw that was to set up, a, set up a slide projector on the screen and photograph them off the screen. Um, the other challenge was that since the slides were um, mounted in you know, glass mounts, um, the focuser on the scanner could get fooled and focus on the glass and not the emulsion. Um, and that had me um, trapped for about six months figuring out what to do. Finally, I realized I could do maximum sharpening. This was in iPhoto. And there was another function, I don't quite understand how it works, called definition, which to my eye is basically more sharpening. So I put maximum sharpening and maximum definition, and they came out fine. And that's all the time we have. Thanks. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> another couple of minutes, and we'll have our next paper. And now for something completely different.
Jordan Mogerman with Fighting Inertia, Changing Careers at Every Life Stage. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, now that wasn't bad. I think we can do better. No, not today. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, who had the talk on interactivity? Um, okay, I was asked today to talk about a, my life experience. Scary. Um, what I've done is, well, I'll tell you what I've done. But I'd like to start with a quote from uh, a guy who's a hero of mine. He's not, he isn't the hero, I mean, he's great, but it's what he epitomized. And he said that courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. I like that. Um, I've made some changes in my life, and I'd like to tell you about them. Um, first of all, let me tell you that, well, let me check my note. Oh, yes, OK. When we're talking about courage, where does that courage come from? And why do we do it? Well, some people say it's because uh, their parents told them. Some people say, oh, well, they had a mentor. Some people say, well, done a lot of research and this seems to be the answer. There's really only one person who inspired me to make the changes that I'm making. Um, this was taken about 1967. Um, this is when I had hair. <laughs> this kid has always been in here. And something happened on a, about two years after this. A little event, nobody's heard of it, I know. But a little event happened that really kind of changed my life. Oh yeah, they said I was very... Uh, <laughs> They always said I was very gifted. Uh, this is not the event. Yeah, it could have been. This one is. This happened on my fifth birthday. And I remember watching it uh, about 10.30 at night, as I recall. My father dragged me down into the basement and said, watch this, this is history. And I remember the words, live from the surface of the moon, across the bottom. Um, ever since then, I've been a space nut, a shirt notwithstanding. Oh, by the way, thank you, Desiree. Um, thought I was going to become an astronaut. Uh, several reasons why I didn't become an astronaut. Number one, I'm not a math person. Uh, number two is this reason. Little warning, um, you might want to look away. I can get it rolling. I'm going to recommend you watch the bottom center of the screen. And feel free to look away if you need to. It keeps going. Sorry. So as you can tell, I really wasn't meant for space flight. Um, I tell you what, though, my, my early passion got put off for a number of reasons. Um, number one, it was easier. I grew up in a little bitty town in the middle of Missouri here, very near here. And although we did have McDonnell Douglas here, the odds of a seven-year-old kid Growing up 15, 20 years later and then becoming an engineer for McDonnell Douglas, that just seemed a little out of reach. So I did other things. Um, I went to ultimately graduate high school, went to college. Uh, my first year in college was disastrous. Thought I was going to be a programmer. 
computer programmer, you know? That was the up and coming thing. Uh, no, no. So I changed schools, uh, took a variety of classes, rediscovered graphic design. I'd been drawing my whole life and forgot. My dad once said, you know, Jordan, you spent your whole childhood sitting in front of the TV, cutting and pasting little pieces of paper. And now here you are, out of school, what are you doing? You're cutting and pasting little pieces of paper. <laughs> I uh, graduated, I uh, opened my own firm, Jordan Graphics, and I was a freelance graphic designer for about five years. Didn't work real well, though. Uh, it never paid its own bills. Uh, I'm not saying I'm a sad guy, I'm just letting you know my experience. Um, decided after about five years I needed another set of schooling because I had reached the limit of what I could do with that company. I was doing a lot of business cards, envelopes, letterhead, you know. It was boring after a while. So I went back to school, uh, got an MF, uh, MFA in graphic design and computer animation. At the end though, about two weeks before graduation, I got a very important call from my mother, who I love. But when she wants an answer, she wants an answer then. It's the way she is. And she called me and she asked me a question. What are you going to do with this schooling? We need to know. You need to know. Okay. She gave me some options. The first option, I didn't expect. Uh, no. It's, this is absolutely true. Uh, the second option. Hey, she said, you know, at your age, you'll go in as an officer. I didn't tell her I'd probably be the kind that ended up getting shot by his own troops in peacetime. So that was out. She said, well, then there's only one more option. It's the only thing left. Well, it turns out that was the hit. And I was lucky enough that in my old uh, undergrad school, uh, a position was open, and I applied and I got it. And yeah, that's really me. Um, here's, though, where the interesting thing happened. I started teaching, and the next 18 years or so disappeared. A lot of stuff happened in that time. I got married, got divorced, um, trained a lot of designers. A couple of my designers, uh, my students went on to become animators for Disney. One of them went on to, and is still a, uh, an animator for uh, DreamWorks. So I had some good students, uh, some clinkers, but some good ones. But. I just got the bell. <laughs> but I didn't know what I wanted to do because I was bored and I wasn't happy. I was doing what everybody else said I should do and not what I wanted to do. So I got a lot of advice. I decided to listen to my mentor. And he said, go there. <laughs> now, I never liked beer much, but I went back to school at night, got an MA in History and Museum Studies, uh, started volunteering. A very generous guy named John Lakey, I don't know if any of you know him, very nice man, very generously allowed me to volunteer. And after about a year and a half, a part-time position opened up doing shows. And I applied and I got it. And right now I'm working full-time still at the school, part-time at the planetarium, and in about three and a half years, I can retire from teaching. I've decided that formal education isn't my gig, but I adore doing shows. They also, I also am doing a lot of other stuff there. They've got me doing a lot of graphic design as well. Um, doing slates for uh, shows. Um, here, I'm gonna show you just a few of them. Um, I also do a lot of scanning. You mentioned uh, slide scanning. I do a lot of that for archival purposes. And I'm also working on new graphics for a new show we're doing as part of a uh, NASA grant. So they seem to like my work, I guess. Um, 
Recently, though, found, as was mentioned, some old glass slides in, in two boxes. Nobody knew what they were. They'd been around there forever. So I started scanning them, and guess what I discovered? Oh, sorry, these are some other things. Guess what I discovered? Surveyor. Old surveyor shots. You look at this foot pad, it's surveyor, right? And so I'm, I've just scanned those, and I'm doing some other archival stuff. This is the Earth from the surface of the moon in 1968, late 68. I've been on TV. My 15 minutes are over. My, my recommendations, number one, if you want to change, if the little kid inside you is not happy, change, number one. Know exactly what it is you want to do, but not necessarily where. Be open to a move or change. Number two, be a sponge. Talk to everybody in the field, but don't take all their advice. Listen to it and see what sounds right for you. Number three, stay focused. That's the hardest part, almost the hardest part. Number four, power through the difficulties. It's easy to say, oh, geez, I don't know. I'm going to start this tomorrow. That's where my 18 years went. I kept putting things off. Number five, take true care of yourself. Eat regularly. Take your meds. Get lots of sleep. And if that means you go to bed at 7 o'clock at night, do it. Just don't admit it in public. And this is the most important one. This is the one that has all, that's all the cliches are about. But the reason it's so cliched is because it's true. You got to remember, there's really only one person you need to, to answer to. Now, I was going to read a quote from Sid Caesar. He's, I think, a genius. But I think I'm out of time. So it basically says, uh, there's now, there's a was, and there's a going to be. If you have a good now, you're going to have a good was, and that turns into a good going to be. But if you have a bad now, it's a bad was. And if you hang on to that bad was, it becomes a bad going to be. You've got to get rid of the was, the bad was. Because if you hang on to those, they become coulda, shouldas. That's what I had. Um, but bottom line, there's really only one person you have to answer to. What would they say? And that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. We will have no time for questions, but I'm sure you will get many people visiting you oh. after work. That's a good one. I don't have any answers in here. Okay. The next talk will start in three minutes. It's, a, it's just a convenient place to set it.
We're now going to hear from Patty Seaton and her virtual partner, Virginia Fulton, <laughs> about building teachers' self-efficacy through professional learning opportunities. There's a mouthful. Yeah, well, that's because you know how every school system has to change. You know, they have to justify their six-digit uh, paycheck. So it's no longer professional development. It's now professional learning opportunity. So get that in your vocabulary. Now, I'm just curious, how many of you all actually run teacher workshop trainings at your facilities? I'm guessing that's probably why you're still here and, and, and at my talk. So um, this is something that we're doing more and more of. We're a pretty small staff. We are a staff of seven at the Owen Science Center. I'm a planetarium staff of basically me and then Russ, who is my mentor. Um, but one of the things that my boss is encouraging us to do is that we are kind of mentor teachers for the county. So we're trying to you know, share what we can. And my, my colleague, Virginia Fulton, yeah, she's an amazing person. I keep telling her when I grow up, I want to be her. She's like a year older than me, so I told her I have to catch up. So, um, But she's really good about, about developing and, and working with a new model of the cohort model. So that's something that was kind of new to me because we're so, how many of you, when you do your teacher workshops, it's like a one-off. It's one day and then that's it. And how many of you do multi-day teacher workshops? Yeah, very few. I'm like, I see like one other hand. So this is something we're moving towards in order to kind of move teachers along in a cohort so that they're working together. And the ultimate goal is that we are just facilitators. We're true facilitators and they are becoming the, their own experts and training each other and working with each other. So building off this model with Virginia, I was actually able to use our NASA grant and did this with, well actually with the New Horizons grant. So what I did is I had a two and a half day workshop set up for teachers. So we started out with, a, these are kind of really hard to see because you all know how hard it is to take pictures in the planetarium. But I spent the first morning that I had these teachers actually training them about the New Horizons mission and I gotta admit, it's like, because I'm around you all so often, it's really hard for me to understand that these people had actually never heard of New Horizons and didn't know there was a mission to Pluto. So I got super excited because it's like, wow, they're hearing this for the first time. So we're training them about New Horizons, and then we wanna know why is it going to be important for them. Um, I mean, STEM education is really important nowadays. So uh, Virginia Fulton, she's amazing at coming up with activities. So after we had spent the morning, we spent our afternoon actually doing some hands-on activities with the teachers that they could do in turn in the classroom with their, their students. Just different, how to in reverse engineer a mission. So we basically talked about what were the goals of New Horizon and how do you build your spacecraft to do that. Then Virginia's really good about, we did some remote sensing activities. There's Virginia right there. So here she is, she's awesome. So uh, we've had the teachers involved in the remote sensing activities. Uh, she has a really wonderful way of turning it into graph and then actually even then bringing it into Excel so that they can create it so that depending on what resources the teachers had, anything from we can put together the box yourself toward you can use your computers if the students have that available to them. So we wanted to give them multiple resources because we realized that even though computer technology should be available in the schools, it is not always available in the schools. Um, so this is them working on these different activities. The spatial resolution activity was just really super fun, trying to decide where you're gonna land your spacecraft and doing the best you can based upon your remote sensing. Um, so these are all just different activities that we had the teachers working with and then the idea was they were gonna go use it in the classroom and then come back and share how did it work, what worked, what didn't work, and what other activities did they come up with as a result that was specific to their needs. It was especially helpful for Virginia and I because we had some special needs teachers that were part of our workshop and they were able to help us learn how can we better develop these activities to meet the needs of students that have you know, visual impaired, uh, mental impaired, uh, hearing impaired, so able to help us create other ways to do these activities. So again, this is part of this whole new model. We're not here just to, to teach them. We want to reciprocate and learn from them. So of course we had to throw in some people. This was kind of fun. I was like, I, I love printing out images from both the Dawn and the New Horizons mission and just have the, te the teachers looking at the data and what features do you see? Now that you've seen a couple of dwarf planets, how would you define a dwarf planet? It was very fun to have them looking at the data and do that. So that was all day one. Uh, day two, we had actually purchased the Seeker software um, that can do a little bit of flyby of the solar system. 
and we were going to train the teachers on using that so that they could actually work with their students and we'd have a contest to see you know, how, if the students can come up with stuff. But we still had some more ideas bringing back. Now we're gonna share out how you applied, what you did with your, your students since you learned our activities. We did a little bit more, some more activities analyzing Spectre, which we've all done. I'm not really good about taking pictures. The reason we had pictures from day one is because Virginia was there. There's no pictures from day two because I always forget to take pictures. So I took pictures of my really boring directions on how I had to, I, I actually had some guided tours for the teachers so that they could learn the software. Um, they said that really the students picked up on it much faster than they did, which we all expected. And then the last thing we did that day is we said, okay, now that we've learned how to use this software, what do we want the students to do? And I actually had both middle school and high school teachers as part of this cohort. So we put the middle schools together and they came up with their own rubric of what they wanted, their expectations for their students to be able to do. High schoolers did it. So you can kind of see this is the, the rubric that we use. And then day three was only a half day. And what we did was we actually had them bring their student projects back in and all of us use the rubric to evaluate the student projects. And the idea was, even though this was the end of the two and a half day of the professional learning opportunity, is that we wanted the, the students to be able to come back for a big Pluto Palooza event that we were gonna hold. So um, it wasn't mandatory, obviously, the teachers weren't gonna get paid anymore. That's the nice thing about these things is teachers like to come when they get paid. So it's really nice when you have great money to do that. Um, but it was surprised at how many people did come. And this was kind of a fun event that we did. But again, remember, I'm operating on a staff of seven people trying to run this big Pluto Palooza event. So you can kind of see we had some fun things going on. This was kind of the culmination. And again, I wasn't really great about taking pictures of the students presenting their projects, but we made sure that every student had a nice certificate and of course the planet um, stamps is just, I, I just love that we have Pluto stamps. It's just really fun. So um, this, again, Virginia was there, so I got one picture of myself on the day of the Pluto Palooza. We had lots of other events where this is the, you know, weigh yourself on the other planets, Matt. Um, we had some other, some hands-on activities going on with, you know, with the, have you done the Coke cans with the different amounts of weight for the pennies for each of the planets? We had that going on in one classroom. We had a STEAM activity, so we had some of the images available of what Pluto looked like, and then we had people recreate it in whatever art form they wanted, so we had different supplies. They could make a 3D model, they could just color it, whatever. Um, and this, this was a public event, so at this point we were open up, but we had encouraged those teachers that we had been working with to help participate. And, and, and then actually, the, the, so this was, I guess, two years ago, and then so the, last year, we actually had some of the teachers who had participated in that come back as facilitators from some additional training that we had. Because we're just trying to continue with this model of, the, we are not the experts, we are experts together, and we want the teachers to be working together. And we think it worked out pretty well. Um, oh good, so that's perfect timing. I just wanted to share a couple of the responses from the teachers. Um, so the teachers that I had for mine were, the, they said the training is interactive, hands-on, and up-to-date information for students and teachers. Love the experience, and I want more of these fantastic learning. Um, and I guess I still have a handful of slides that will just roll through because these are actually from, I got my idea from what Virginia had already been doing with, um, with teachers just in general for all the different STEM activities that we run at the Owen Science Center. So she had, I'll just run through the pictures, but she had actually asked the teachers in their evaluation to complete the following sentence. After listening and providing feedback during the teacher presentations, I realized, and this is my favorite, that I learned as much from my fellow colleagues as I did from the instructors. I was really thankful that the instructors welcomed the interactions amongst all of us who were enrolled in the class. Everyone's feedback was helpful. So we felt like we were successful in our goals of having the teachers work together build up their own knowledge, become the experts, and we think it will be more effective in sharing. So that's, that's all I have to say, and I just wanna thank Virginia for being a great role model for me, and she's not a planetarium person, but it doesn't matter. She's been a, extremely helpful in helping me build my own efficacy and being a better teacher. So, any questions? Perfect timing.
uh, the activities you did with your teachers on each of those three days are though is that kind of right up in your proceedings so we could see what you did and like which Ooh, days no, and I just the was, lessons themselves. I guess I can. Add, I wonder. Can I still add that deal? Because no, we just put down the. You know how it is putting things together before you go, but no, I definitely could write up what we did for each of those activities. That would be fun. Thanks for asking that. Would, that'd that. be wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> just a quick comment because. We just did an educator open house like the week before I came here, and we wanted to make sure we spent lots of time uh, showing, not telling, as well as feedback, feedback, feedback. I, I'm so glad to hear you mention that need because the teachers feel like they have are valued so much more when you give them lots of opportunities to give, to let them feedback. And so that was something that I observed, and I'm glad to, to see you. Uh, incorporating that so yeah, we're, we're trying to get to like that third that third day of the workshop is it's all them presenting and not nothing of us we're just there facilitating well, we get paid too that's nice so having attended thousands of teacher workshops for various things um, literally almost uh, the best kinds of workshops that you're are doing what you're doing feel free to turn the teachers loose to design the activities so you give them the information give them materials and ideas for work with and just um, have them work in groups to uh, to actually create activities that would get that across to the kids, and you would you would be amazed what you can come up with. Great, I appreciate your comments because this is what this is about. We're building our own efficacy right here. <laughs> Those are the big words. Virginia has all the big words. I just need to come present. Um, the days that you had these workshops, was it consecutive? Was it over a couple of weeks? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Now, is it, we, the first two were kind of close together, but we obviously had a long period of time between, at least for mine, between day two and day three because we actually had to have the teachers go back, train their students, allow them time to have this contest, and then bring it back to us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, by the time we had all the days approved, we didn't have, I think we only had about a month and a half where we would re really hope to have a lot longer time. But I wish I could have found the projects, but I couldn't find them in time because I would have shared one. But the best project of all of them was from the special needs kids. That was, that was amazing. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. <laughs> Our last paper will begin in three minutes.
Our final presentation will be on planetarium community collaborations, building audiences, and expanding horizons from Sean Latch. Good morning. So thank you for coming to the last paper of the last session. So I really do appreciate you popping out here, of course. Uh, and I'm sure I know as most of us were very, very tired. But I did want to chat a little bit um, today about some opportunities that you might have. I'm at a small university uh, planetarium in Orono, Maine, and thought I'd share some of the things we've been doing over the last sort of year and a half, two years or so. So this is the building I'm in. It's the Amer Astronomy Center at the University of Maine. And that center actually is composed of a, the Jordan Planetarium, which is a 10 meter dome, 4K system with 50 seats. So it's, a, a, again, one of the smaller planetariums. We do a variety of public planetarium programs, typically on Friday nights at 7 p.m. We have children's programs Sunday afternoons at 2. And then we do a whole variety of special events and lectures. Also, of course, K-12 classes, university labs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kept quite busy. And our facility has one full-time staff. You're looking at it. And then we also work with a variety of students. You might have met Scott Mitchell, one of my grad students, who is here. Um, we have uh, one other grad student, and then we have four undergraduate students that work with us as well. The center has the planetarium. We also have a lobby and multi-purpose room. Um, and that multi-purpose room is where we conduct labs. We have a kiosk gift shop, which is, again, basically a kiosk. That's all it is, really tiny. Uh, but we do hold a variety of events and hands-on activities in the classroom area as well. We have um, two observatories, actually. One, the Jordan Observatory, which was installed when we built the building, which has a 20-inch uh, plane wave telescope that's used by undergraduate and graduate students for research. We've also even had some high school students do some research on this. And Scott Mitchell, the graduate student who is here with me, actually automated this so that it can be operated completely remotely which is really great, especially in some of the main winters. <laughs> now, most recently, one of the projects uh, that I had when I got there was to relocate a historic 8-inch Alvin Clark telescope. Um, it was in the center of campus near the Student Union. The telescope was in, in great shape, but the building had fallen into disrepair. Uh, so over the last year and a half or so, we finally got it relocated to a roll-off roof building. Um, and we had the opening on the 15th of uh, September. And so the plan with that is after our public evenings, now we'll be able to do telescope observations with the public when the weather cooperates, because the plane wave really is only set up for research purposes. There's no eyepiece. It's set very high up. And so we really wanted to have a telescope we could use for observing. And the other thing that we use is for, so Monday through Thursday evenings, it will be used for our astronomy lab classes, because we have a variety of other telescopes, including the plane wave, but we also want them to do actual observing. And we had some other ones that we would just pull out, but this gives us a chance to do regular observing. Well, really what I was here to talk with you about was the way we've been using our facility and some of the things we've tried to do is basically build community partnerships and collaborations. And when I got there, that was one of the things that really was one of the goals of the university was to sort of expand and enhance what the planetarium was doing. So there's a whole variety of ways you can do partnerships. Some are very, very simple, and I'm going to start with those, and then others take more time and effort. But one of the simplest partnerships we started right after I got there was I met with the Maine Discovery Museum, which is a little museum in downtown. Um, it's a children's museum, but they are hoping to expand into doing and becoming more of a science center. And we just started a simple ticketing partnership that whenever there's a school break, we give discounts on each other's programs if you go to the other one. So if someone goes to the Maine Discovery Museum and they bring uh, basically a little card they get for attending, they will get a dollar off of our shows. And the, the reverse is true. If they come to us first, uh, they get a little card that they take to the Maine Discovery Museum and they get a dollar off of admission there. And that partnership actually really yielded some nice results for us in terms of the school breaks. It, it bumped up attendance, and it also you know, was a really great way to begin doing some partnerships with them moving forward. We're actually looking at now a partnership for educational groups coming to both locations. And so that's something we're working on. The libraries, if you haven't worked with your public libraries, I highly, highly urge you to consider it. They're so, at least ours, are so easy to work with, so friendly, and 
um, they really are interested in doing a variety of different things. So Orono Public Library, which is uh, where the planetarium is, came and said, hey, we'd like to do something for our patrons. Can we do a ticketing partnership with you? Now, they don't have tickets, but basically what they wanted to do was create an opportunity that people at their facility could check out tickets. So they were willing to buy tickets in, in a block, and we did that. We basically gave them the tickets at half price. They bought a tickets, tickets in a block and then could check them out to their patrons free, basically giving them to their patrons. And that also helps us reach some people who might not come to the planetarium regularly and some of those who are in need. So that was a really great way to do a partnership with them. We also have started to do some things with them where we're ex exploring doing um, some projects around their summer reading program next summer, and we're hoping to do some special programs around that as well. The next type of thing, of course, takes a little more time, but really can be a lot of fun. We have started to work with a variety of different partners to collaborate on events for around specific, part, uh, specific content. So one of the fun events we did, of course, was the music of Star Wars, the Bangor Symphony Orchestra. Bangor is the, the big town in our area, quote unquote, big being 45,000. But they do have their own symphony, they have their own theater group, um, they have a ballet, the whole nine yards. They have quite a bit of, of things for a town because it's sort of, we're sort of the central hub in our area of Maine. So they were gonna be doing the music of Star Wars for one of their main big concerts coming up in March. So we partnered with them and we said, well, okay, what if we were to run the, the program Stars, which is narrated by Mark Hamill, of course, of Star Wars fame. And they liked this idea. So we partnered and we actually had live musicians in the dome, which you kind of see over here at the far end there. But we started off with a string quartet, which did two of our evening performances. They did a, a basically a 15 minute performance before the show. Um, and then we had their brass ensemble. But it was a great way for, for, first off, that we promoted their concert, their big concert coming up, and then they promoted us to their audiences. And we both saw some increases in attendance after that. Another, uh, of course, organization that we partnered with was the Bangor Public Library. Um, and that library, of course, actually is a little bit larger. They were bringing in an ex exhibition on the origin of humans, a Smithsonian exhibit that was traveling. And so we said, hey, what if we do an event with you and we bring in and use natural selection? And they liked that idea, so we did a lot of cross-promotion. Again, it built a nice partnership. And actually, by doing that, it launched a whole variety of other things that we're now working with the library on. And so this, again, was a really great way to uh, build collaborations in the community. By the way, these things also get you recognized. So your department starts to recognize you, but then the dean and the provost start to pay attention when they see that your name is all over town, which really has worked out well. Following that, we were in discussions with the Maine Gem and Mineral Museum, which is actually quite some distance from us. It's about a two-hour drive away, but they have one of the most extensive uh, collections of meteorites, and in particular, lunar uh, meteorites. And so we partnered with them uh, on building an activity kit that could go out to schools um, around the area, talking about meteorites and also about mi minerals and gems in general. But we started talking with them, and they wanted to get involved and do something special with us, so they helped us bring in the program Asteroid. Um, and that was really nice. We were able to bring in that program, do some partnerships with them, and now they're thinking because they're two hours away and, and it's hard for children to get to them, that they're gonna put a meteorite display in our lobby in the next year. So that's another way, again, of, of working with other institutions that raise the awareness. I'm sure everyone did Eclipse stuff here. Nah, no one did Eclipse stuff, right? So just to give you an idea, we had a partnership with the public library for that. Again, they were giving out Eclipse glasses. We brought in the program Totality from Bayes Mountain, which was really wonderful for that. And they asked us to do, um, or asked me to do a lecture. And they put me in a room, they said, ah, we have a room for 100, and you know, we'd like you to do this lecture. And we had over 200 people, they were trying to figure out how to make it work at that point, which is really cool. Um, and I was actually getting ready to go out of town because I had plans to be in the path of totality. So I left two graduate students in charge. We had over 1,000 people at the planetarium that day. They were kept quite busy. But this was really great because they got very excited and, and between natural selection, that led to this, the program you know, the, around uh, the eclipse, and now it's leading to many more things. They want me to do a big New Year's Eve thing with them this year, so it, it should be quite fun. But it's really great for that. 
We have a program with the Challenger Learning Center um, where we use Dawn of the Space Age, where we have programs where they come to us and we go to them, but basically it's a dual program, so a school will choose and actually do both locations. So we have a, a fun partnership around that. That's uh, increased attendance at both. We did a play called Constellations with our theater department, where we had two um, actors and used a live stage, performing live on stage in the, in the planetarium, and then used the dome as a digital drop back. And we've also worked with the math department in some of their VR stuff, exploring ways to use the dome and VR technology. I know I'm almost out of time here, or pretty much out of time. Two minutes? Okay. So from that, we also brought in, or I decided I wanted to use the dome beyond astronomy, because that's really important to get the university involved. So we created something called the Science Lecture Series, where we bring in visiting scientists, either from the university or from the community, to do programming at our planetarium. And we leverage the dome resources and visualizations to do this. So we've had everything from the one that, that took place actually when the day I was here was on cancer research. Um, and then we've had, of course, climate change, um, art and science and visualization. We have a video game and um, a Nat Geographic sort of uh, science visualizer in town who did something with us. And, and of course, bioengineering did some things with, um, you know, from lightsabers to tricorders, which is kind of fun in terms of looking at how light can be used uh, for a variety of biomedical applications. This is also leading to a collaboration with the Climate Change Institute of Maine, which is one of the nationally recognized ones, that I'm very interested to pull the audience. How many of you have been to a Cavley training at Chicago? How many of you would be interested in doing something like that around climate change? All right, so we're looking into potentially getting a grant to do that at our facility because we have Paul Mayevsku, who's, um, again, one of the leading climate change folks in the US. And we might have that set up hopefully for 2019. Next year's gonna to be too busy for me for other reasons. But, and then the last thing of course, one of the things how you get this, the word out is by partnering in your community with marketing people. So one of the ways we do that is we partner with the, the uh, BDN, which is our local paper. Um, they asked me if I would be willing to do a blog, so I do a, a blog with them called Eye on Main Skies, where we share sky things. Um, and as a result, they give us some advertising. Facebook, of course, is huge, and we do some paid advertising with BDN. Then I do regular radio appearances on two of the different local morning shows and some TV stuff and a bunch of other stuff. But anyway, I highly recommend that you consider partnerships. They will bring in new audiences, increase your attendance. They will increase the, your visibility in the community, which makes the deans and provosts happy. And of course, that will help with other things. And it strengthens the place in the community and it's fun and exciting, so. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. That's all the time we have. <laughs> and let's show our appreciation for all of the speakers in this session for being able to do something on Saturday morning. <laughs>